Hello, and welcome to today's conversation on the year in enterprise tech. I'm Bennett Richardson, General Manager of Protocol. Thank you for joining us, and an extra thank you to everyone who joined me and Tom Krasett in person last week for our Protocol Enterprise Cocktail at AWS reInvent. It was great to see so many of you face-to-face -face and hear about your own year in the enterprise. 2020, excuse me, 2021 has been a massive year in cloud and enterprise tech. AWS turned 15, welcomed a new CEO. Salesforce completed its acquisition of Slack and promoted Brett Taylor. Billions of dollars of business moved into the cloud and enterprise software. And the chip shortage and a global pandemic overshadowed it all. What stood out and what's next in 2022? Our panel of experts will dive in and share their thoughts. We're so glad you could tune in today. And if you're not already subscribed, don't forget to sign up for Protocol Enterprise and Protocol's family of newsletters at protocol.com slash newsletters. Now let's get to it. I'm excited to bring up our moderator, Tom Krasett, Protocol's enterprise editor and author of the Protocol Enterprise newsletter to introduce our panel. Tom, take it away. Thanks, Bennett. Uh, and thank you all for joining us and, and, our, and our panel of esteemed uh, guests here. Um, I am Tom Krasett, enterprise editor for Protocol. I would like to uh, introduce our panel. Uh, we have uh, Sheila Gulati from Tola Capital, Corey Quinn from the Duckbill Group, and Liz Fong Jones from Honeycomb. And if each one of you could say a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and, and uh, name one cool thing you saw at reInvent last week. So, Sheila Gulati, I'm an enterprise software venture capitalist. I had a long career as well at Microsoft running the database and developer platforms business. Um, so I'm many cool things at reInvent, but one that I'll highlight is really the shift left phenomena to developer centric infrastructure, developer first conversation. I'm excited to dive more into that. I'm Corey Quinn. I'm the chief cloud economist at the Duckbill Group because I spend a lot of time helping companies make their AWS bills less horrifying, which means I'm sad basically all of the time. I was at reInvent in person last week, and my favorite thing that I saw there was their new managed database, specifically because there wasn't one. Nobody needs yet another one of those things. So it was a welcome and very refreshing change. Hi, I'm Liz Fong Jones, and I'm a principal developer at Honeycomb.io, which is a company that helps developers get better observability into their software and debug issues more quickly. We're also fairly substantial AWS uh, consumers, and we also wind up testing a lot of things that are at the bleeding edge of AWS, which is really exciting. So definitely one of the things that excited me, you know, I was attending virtually was to see the focus on sustainability and also kind of paring down the offerings rather than kind of offering an increasing plethora of options to kind of make things more standard and uniform across the board. And I think that that's something that many people are going to welcome. Thanks everybody. So let's, uh, let's dive in. I mean, I think the first, thing, the biggest change between this reInvent and uh, all the reInvents in the past, this was the 10th year of the conference, was that there was a new CEO leading the charge. Um, Adam Solipsky delivered his first keynote address as, as CEO of AWS. And, you know, there was a, I mean, as there often is with these keynotes, a, a wide range of feedback based on um, what was said and what was covered. And, you know, the, the way that folks read the tea leaves on these things can get a little tiring at, at, at times. But, you know, I think that, you know, one thing I was kind of wondering about was, you know, compared to other, you know, keynotes that uh, Amazon CEO now, Andy Jassy has delivered in the past, this one was a little shorter and it seemed to contain a less uh, few or fewer, I should say, enormous game changer announcements. And, and I think to some of the points that you all just made, maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, but I'd like to get your perspectives on that, you know, sort of how Adam uh, came off to the crowd and, and, and what sort of the things, some of the things that he chose to emphasize, you know, how they, uh, how they relate to, you know, what AWS customers, partners, and, and even competitors are looking for. I think definitely one of the things that I noticed was that there is a very large focus on kind of vertical by vertical announcements. For instance, they spend a lot of time talking about the kind of five private 5G thing. And in my mind, like as someone who develops software as a service, this is something that's pretty far from the list of things I consider. Um, 
and it was definitely very odd, right? Like you, you mentioned that it was not game changing and I, and I agree, right? Like that it is game changing if you're in that sector and it's not game changing if you're not in that sector, right? It's kind of a question of how much has the well run dry on the list of things that Amazon can do that are applicable across the board and how many things are now just game changers for an individual sector. Yeah, sir, I'm, I'm trying to build a website here. It says web services right in the name. Uh, I will take the dark and cynical view as well of was this intentional or did just a bunch of new services they were planning to launch not hit the deadline? So now they have to repaint, recast this as a rebuilding year. Are we going to see twice as many new ridiculous services launching next year? I hope not, but because it was nice to see the emphasis, if it is a genuine emphasis on shoring up existing offerings rather than launching uh, slightly different versions of them as brand new services. I'll take the other side of the argument, which is, you know, Adam is a well-known person in the Seattle community having run Tableau. He's an extremely good listener. He's incredibly customer focused. And I actually love that he brought Adina Friedman out, put like, you know, she's such a boss, put her on stage right at the beginning, said, hey, NASDAQ is running on AWS. That kind of obviates the question for anyone else, right? Everyone can run on, on AWS if NASDAQ is running on AWS. And, and I think that platform businesses can take a lot of criticism for being uh, boring in some cases, as people might say. But actually, technologists also love the predictability, the reliability, and the roadmap transparency, especially as they're going towards the enterprise, which Adam is incredibly well suited to do. Yeah, and definitely to that to that point, right? Like it was kind of this thing of let's make sure that we're not doing five different things going in five different directions. Let's make sure they all have good synergy with each other. For instance, one of the things that we were very excited about was like storage instances are great, Graviton is great, two great tastes that go together, right? Like why was this not a thing before? It, Sheila, to your point that you made at the, in the intro about this being more developer focused, I, I kind of wanted to, to drill down on that a little bit because I felt like the keynote was maybe a little bit more enterprise focused in terms of um, the way that the, the initial um, Adam's keynote anyway, uh, Werner's keynote, a, a different beast. But, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what the opening, um, the opening presentation to the crowd seemed to be very focused on the need of the larger enterprise. And I'm just curious you know, what you saw that, that made you feel a little differently. Well, totally agree from an Adam keynote perspective. I think that part of the greatness of Adam is he's going to let Werner tell the developer story and he's going to let his leadership team shine in their brilliance, right? And so he's saying, hey, we're mission critical. We can do everything for the enterprise that anyone needs to do. And we'll do that for you, technologist. And that's coming next. So I was actually really comfortable with the the, the, the partnership between the two of them. It was a refreshing change to um, Andy Jassy's style historically, where he would start his keynotes by taking one giant breath and then try to recite all the new features before he has to take a second breath. And in the next two and a half hours, he generally winds up getting most of the way through before needing to t sneak off backstage during a partner speaker so he can get oxygen. But it's the, but yeah, it was nice to see the, the more even pacing throughout the week. And I think we can probably all agree that the best thing about this past week's keynote was that it was an hour shorter than previous year's keynotes. So I think that uh, everyone appreciated getting that hour back. Um, I wanted to move on to one thing that uh, Adam talked about briefly during his keynote, but that was expanded on over the course of the week. And and a subject that's near and dear to Liz's heart, I know, and, and that's Graviton, the the ARM-based server processor that AWS rolled out three years ago, and that you know is really one of the most interesting things I think the company has to offer that's differentiated from the competition. Um, and so I'm curious what everyone thinks about this, and, and I know that you all have different perspectives on this depending on where you sit. But Liz, to start with you, I know you've had some experience, you know, uh, testing Graviton three, the the newest chip, as well as kind of the um, the run of, 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 you've had some years now on it where you've had some chance to, to really see some performance. I, I'm curious for your high level thoughts and then also what you think about the newest generation. Yeah, so in terms of the performance evolution, the Graviton One chip was a proof of concept similar to how Apple released the, um, the iPad in a box uh, when they are initially preparing for the ARM transition, it was a way for people to get easy access to these things that you wouldn't necessarily have access to. With Graviton 2, it actually offered a carriage switch, right? Like it was a, you are going to get better price performance. 
And the thing that really strikes me is that there is so much greenfield stuff to be done in the ARM ecosystem to make things faster, where it's not unusual to see 30% year-on-year improvements, as opposed to the Intel landscape where you're, you'll be lucky to see 15 to 20% improvements year-on-year. And I think that that pace of innovation is something that is really, really remarkable uh, in terms of AWS being able to differentiate there. That being said, AWS is not alone in having ARM chips. Ampere chips exist in uh, Equinix Metal and, and also in Oracle Cloud. So it's important to consider that there is competition here. You're not locking yourself into Amazon when you adopt uh, an ARM architecture. And it seems likely that you know, Microsoft and Google have talked about their own chip design efforts. You know, um, Google has certainly, you know, architected a lot of AI chips. You know, Microsoft has, you know, people who have worked on Xbox as well as internal data center chips. It's not hard to see a future in which they, you know, will jump on board that train if, if there really is demand. Maybe. The challenge is that they're just now a couple of years behind because, we saw the evolution that uh, that Apple had to go through, the evolution that Amazon had to go through, where you have to get a, that initial developer platform out there before you can start scaling it. And I worry that uh, Google and Microsoft have not yet in the year 2021 going into 2022 released any non-x86 uh, architecture chips for people to even sample or preview. Corey, I'm curious about what you think in terms of the real world cost optimization, you know, benefits of, of this chip for, for some of the folks that you talk to? Like, is this something they're really thinking about? Is it something they're waiting and seeing? Where does that stand? Well, I do talk to Liz periodically, and I think you've already gotten her and Honeycomb's approach on it. The From my perspective, the heavy lift was Graviton 2. Graviton 1 was a proof of concept that was, oh, that's adorable. Graviton 2 is when it became viable and there was a reason to move. And that was the heavy lift for folks who started down that path, especially the early adopters, because that's switching to an entire new processor architecture. For most of my crappy applications, it looked like Bash scripts or Python, kind of. That's great. That's easy and it's not hard to move. But for anything that's a little heavy, Year, there are challenges. Now, going from Graviton 2 to Graviton 3, it's a relatively straightforward shift. It's just, it's just the new generation. That doesn't mean everyone's going to do it just because inertia is a powerful beast. But it is that big transition of getting on to Graviton 2 is nothing near that is going to appear for Graviton 3. My personal suspicion is that Graviton 3 was ready to go 18 months ago, but they're, they spent that much time trying to figure out what to name the successor to Graviton 2 because Amazon is very, very bad at naming things. Can't go wrong with an incremental upgrade, I guess. But. Exactly. I would, I'd love to give a shout out, though, to the Annapurna team, because it's always interesting in, in our business and totally self-serving to say Amazon, AWS doesn't buy a lot of companies. And the big announce, the big reveal on stage is something that happened through an acquisition. And I think it's interesting to we'll see, probably see them really continue to dial up their acquisitive nature as they continue to see more innovation in the ecosystem. Let's come back to that, Sheila, because I definitely want to I want to I want to talk about that more a little later. But you know, specifically with respect to Graviton and the work you do with startups, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there is, you know, kind of if you're greenfield and, and you're starting an application and you really have no you know, history, is this something that startups in your purview are looking at? And I'm also curious about opportunities around it, you know, in terms of of optimization in terms of tooling, in terms of testing, or like if you've seen anything kind of in that sense. Absolutely. I think that one, the ecosystem is incredibly excited about it. Two, the, the opportunities are soup to nuts, right? From, from the point of view of how we design chips from a hardware perspective is stuck in kind of an old school hardware mode and hasn't gotten the benefit from the ways that we design and build software on remote, broad, extensive, large teams. I think that's an area where we're seeing good innovation. I think that then also, as you think about kind of the, the capability that you can leverage kind of at that next level of AI ML compute with these new chips, kind of giving, giving the, the big brain a new body, there's, there is untold innovation happening in the startup ecosystem. And we're incredibly excited to see that just true intelligence of applications coming to the next level. Right. And, and a lot of that will be enabled by this new hardware. And so startups aren't going to miss that at all. And, and I actually do think the rest of the ecosystem will will see more chip uh, innovation from the other mega caps as well. 
It, it also is increasingly becoming the lazy approach. Uh, I tell a beautiful story via means of PowerPoint, the, the, the modern narrative story, and Sheila or a different VC comes by and hits me with the money stick. Great, I'm going to now start a company and hire a bunch of engineers and buy them all late model MacBook Pros because that's the way the world works. Now, if I'm building for Intel from that, I have to do cross compilation. And as opposed to just going with ARM is, since that is what the laptop runs now in the modern Apple era, it's just a straight shot. I have to go out of my way to not use Graviton in an AWS ecosystem now. And that is, it's less an AWS achievement than it is the the simpatico between the chips that AWS is building by way of Annapurna and Apple making their transition at the same time. Yeah, definitely a lot of synergies in terms of ARM holdings getting both uh, both Amazon and Apple to do this mass market transition all at the same time, uh, as opposed to doing one separately from the other. I think there's another interesting argument here, which is around sustainability. And I don't know how much you hear about this, Sheila, in terms of people switching, not necessarily just for the price performance, but because they want that uh, you know, 50%, 60% better compute, uh, compute per watt. Actually, we spend a lot of time on this. We, uh, I don't know if people noticed the the OneTrust acquisition of Planetly this morning. We were really excited to see that happen. The sustainability story in the ecosystem is of primary importance. It's of primary importance to both the tech ecosystem who really does care about doing tech to do good in many, many cases, but then also enterprise buyers care and they want to understand what a technology product now is doing to their carbon footprint. So I think you're absolutely right, Liz, on, on that factor. And I think that there's there's more that will happen. Absolutely. I think the sustainability uh, pillar of the well-architected framework, uh, which is a whole bunch of words stuffed together, is super interesting, particularly for large companies scaling out. I, I would just, the only caution I would offer on that is if you're a student playing around with the stuff for the first time for an afternoon, you will... You will have a bigger carbon footprint by Googling what is the most, what is the greenest way to do this than you will just going ahead and using any of the existing cloud providers to run your thing for the afternoon. This is one of those things that starts to have much more impact the larger you scale. So I'm not at all saying it's not important. Just it's also not something that necessarily is the first thing to optimize for, just like cost. That's a good segue into the next part of what I wanted to talk about from reInvent, which was Werner's keynote. And, you know, that was something he focused on was sustainability. And, and, you know, I think it's fair to say that AWS has been a little slower to this story than, than some of its competitors. Um, if you look at back over the last five years, yeah, I, I feel that that has changed. And I feel that elevating it, you know, in, in a prominent way does, does help change that mentality. But I'm curious from our panel, you know, whether or not you think AWS is, is really taking this seriously and is really, you know, not just talking about it, which is important, but actually delivering things that, that can help people who are concerned about sustainability, you know, actually implement that in their own, in their own businesses. I, you know, I, I, I must admit to having the real cynical, you know, editor reporter hat on this one that I think a lot of these companies talk a lot of, they talk a good game about sustainability while, you know, cramming as many servers and as many data centers into as many parts of the planet as they can. Um, but you know, you you folks are on the are on the you know seeing it on a different level than I am. So I'd love to hear what you think. I think there's more coming very soon, right? As a VC, I often look at the world through the lens of talent. They have a gentleman called Adrian Cockcroft who really built the original Netflix infrastructure, right, in the cloud 10, 15 years ago, and that that team is very very serious about bringing sustainability into AWS, but then also bringing the sustainability frameworks, the, the carbon accounting, right? That, that frankly, Europe is making um, law before the US is, but bringing that into the conversation with their customers. And so they're, they're sort of greenifying AWS and trying to reduce those green premiums, but concurrent with that, they're also taking that capability out to enterprises. And, and I, I actually agree with you, Tom. I don't think that they told enough of that story at reInvent, but I think that we'll hear more coming soon. It's challenging from the cloud provider perspective because it forces them to be a lot more transparent about a whole bunch of different things. The more information they give about their sustainability approach. I have to store a petabyte of data. What is the relative carbon footprint of me storing it in a bunch of different S3 storage tiers, of storing it on EBS, of 
doing something horrifying and storing it in Route 53 records, for example. It's a it winds up getting out of way of exposing what their margins are. And I can understand now them not wanting to break that down on a service by service basis. That said, it's also one of those areas where as a builder, I look at these things and on some level it's okay, you're gonna tell me this service is greener than that other service. And okay, I appreciate that, but you're the ones building this. You're the ones that are determining how it gets run, how it gets built. Isn't this kind of you putting your problem onto me on some level? It becomes nuanced. That becomes part of what Werner said, right? Like, is that AWS has historically basically said, like, we're going to offer, you know, a menu of a thousand items. You get to pick what you want off of it, right? And now it's a matter of maybe that was too complex. Maybe that was offering too much choice. Let's go ahead and start tearing that down while still preserving the properties of you shouldn't need to care about the implementation details of the, of the API, but let's pick smarter options for you. For instance, I think the um, changes around the Glacier and S3 storage tier were a classic example of instead of adding a option you can turn on and off to, you know, Kent, should I get my data instantly or not, right? Like now it's just a thing that's baked into the thing, right? Like I think, I think that the more they can make sustainability a default now, right, the, the easier it's going to be rather than would you like to pay extra for this option? I, actually, I totally agree with you, Liz. And I do think that they're going in that direction. All three of the sort of cloud oligarchs, if you look at Amazon, Microsoft, or Google, will run uh, carbon negative footprints from from a data from a cloud perspective. There's just they absolutely have committed to it. They absolutely will do that. And so I do think the tech sector has the opportunity to really, really drive this forward. Um, these vis vis-a-vis other vis-a-vis -vis other industries, other sectors. And I think that's the kind of quandary, right? Like is what is the carbon footprint of an AWS model running on completely green infrastructure that is prospecting for oil and gas, right? Like that, that seems to be equivalent to the arguments in Australia about, oh, you know, this oil extraction plant is carbon negative because they're sequestering the carbon from extraction. And they're ignoring what happens with when it gets burnt downstream, right? Like I think that's where I would like to see more effort going into. There was one other thing in Werner's keynote that I wanted to highlight before we, we move on to looking uh, toward next year. Um, and that was the discussion about APIs and, and the uh, immutability of APIs. And, you know, there was a quote uh, from uh, Steve O'Grady of Red Monk that, that really made me think about this and, you know, about how the history of AWS was all about, um, you know, up until a few years ago, that the primitives are all you need. And then the last four or five years, they started thinking more about managed services and they started thinking about, okay, maybe people don't want to deal with, you know, the, the lower level stuff as much as we thought they did. And then Werner comes out last week and is like, yeah, no, you really just need to do the basic stuff. Um, and that's kind of the way you should be operating. And, and, you know, also making, I thought, what appeared to be a somewhat internal political statement about APIs and their preser the preser preservation of APIs over time, which, you know, to be honest, I had kind of thought was a given, but I, it was, it was not elsewhere. Bit, well, that's exactly, and th but that's a point that AWS has made many times over the years. And the fact that Werner felt compelled to say that so directly, I thought was, was super interesting. And I'd, I'd love to hear. What and that it was backed up by actions, right? Like right. this uh, last week, AWS also announced that any pre nitro instances are going to be run on Nitro hardware with no changes needed from the API perspective, right? That if you like your I1 instance or your T2 instance, you can just keep running it, right? Like that was- You should not like those running. things, but it makes it greener as well. They also I mean, go I, down a lot less. <laughs> I, I love Werner's uh, commitment and love of developers, right? Like I'm just, my career started as a developer. I, I've always been the put the, Put the product in the hands of developers and and frankly you know choice and, and and opportunity within that choice i think is a really positive thing right so some people will say hey the complexity of what you're giving me with primitives is too much great there's always a framework for you right there really is even if even if you say primitives over frameworks there is always a simplified version of that for developers to run but then a lot of developers we, we want them to have the choice we want them to have the opportunity to take the individual pieces and build from 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 how they perceive the world. Um, again, biased to say, but one of our portfolio companies, Palumi, was one of the companies that Werner talked about. I know Liz uh, knows the company very well, but was one one of the companies that Werner talked about. 
vis-a-vis -vis that developer first infrastructure, right? And putting manageability into the hand of the developer and whether it be a kind of a, a, a many cloud scenario, right? Where I'm pulling in data from different infrastructures, different clouds, different applications, or a multi-cloud scenario where I'm actually programming concurrently to all three clouds. So I, I actually think that the, the focus there and the commitment to developers is, is extremely, extremely impressive, strong and, and consistent for AWS. Yeah, Pulumi is great. The the fact that you can do a deploy of whatever it is you're working on and it takes less than seven seconds in some cases, that is underwear outside the pants superhero speed for things like cloud formation. It's, it's transformative just from that perspective alone. The fact that it transcends to other providers beyond AWS, something that AWS sometimes is loath to admit exists, is just icing on the cake for a lot of those use cases too. And I think that is one of the challenges that if you are focusing on primitives, primitives are things that can be fungible, that can be carried across clouds. Whereas if you start building on something that's higher order like ECS, then you are stuck on ECS because there is no direct equivalent. And that's kind of one of the challenges that AWS has to navigate is encouraging people to build on their primitives while still differentiating on higher order services if people want to get locked in. Which are more profitable for the company as well, right? So there's there's that motivation uh, at the same time. I mean, I think it, it just seems like a really interesting direct statement for him to make at this point in the company's history. And do we, am I reading too much into that? Is, is there more there that, you know, you think is happening internally at AWS or is that just kind of Werner being Werner? We have to look at what happened yesterday. Like that, I'm sorry, that's the elephant in the room. We have to talk about what happened yesterday. And I think what we saw yesterday was that if you were lying on certain primitives like EC2 and S3, you were fine yesterday. If you relied on higher order constructs, you are not having a good day yesterday. We'll take well, it a step seven, further isn't... beyond that because it's it's not the fact that they take outages. Every platform does. The concern is that so many companies in so many industries are all reliant upon the single provider. It used to be today I have an outage and my hospital goes down. And tomorrow Liz has an outage and her manufacturing plant goes down. Today it's AWS goes down and every industry, every almost every company in some respects feels the impact of that. Even if they aren't building on AWS themselves, they've taken dependencies upon people who have. And it becomes a massive centralization risk. I don't know how we fix it. And I don't think AWS has done anything wrong here. It's just a, it's a difficult question for us to wrangle with as a society. And some of their services have adapted to this idea of we need to be more reliable, right? Like we, we understand we are critical infrastructure, right? I think the EC2 team, the S3 team understand that. But I think the kind of higher order services team at Amazon have been thinking about themselves as a kind of value add, value plus, when in fact they are now kind of they're they're now critical supports to uh, to people's businesses to the entire economy and that's a little scary that that's a big responsibility. One thing that struck me too was that so many internal AWS um, support features appeared to rely solely on US East One, and so when there was a problem there they had internal problems just simply responding because a lot of the monitoring, a lot of the, um, you know, the tools that they would normally use to, to recover uh, were impacted, which, I mean. They cited that in their, uh, in their incident document, right? They, their incident retrospective said, we are having trouble remediating because our monitoring systems are not fully working, right? That's what it said on the status page after two hours, but that's what it said on the status page. And there I, are I think ways also, oh, sorry, Sheila, go ahead. I, I, I think it's I think it's a great point, very well put. You often have this tension between the innovation mindset and the mission critical mindset, right? And the the opportunity, those two things can be at odds, right? In certain scenarios. And the opportunity is to figure out how to unify them and go forward. But but Liz, I think you're right. There does need to be a different level of mindset if you want to be mission critical. And these these frameworks have wanted to be mission critical. Yeah, Netflix has done talks in the past where they talk about things like every developer has root in production, et cetera, et cetera. And that's great. And I'm just sitting next to someone in the talk who's taking notes like, we're going to do this too. And I look at this badge and, oh my God, he works for a bank. No, don't do this. The The failure modes are radically different here as far as what you're trying to achieve. I want to, when I'm building nonsense, I want it to be out quickly and sort of working. If I'm working at a bank or an energy company or a hospital, 
I have very different requirements on availability, uptime, and durability of what I built. Totally agree. And and again, first customer on the stage, NASDAQ, that is changing, right? That That, that is the right Im initial immediate statement that the change is there. Yeah, and Matt from Liberty Mutual did a fantastic job as well, talking about serverless in a big E enterprise and how that adoption is going. I love the focus on larger, larger, I guess, institutional style customers, as opposed to the, we're a tiny startup that does Twitter for pets. And we believe that dogs would tweet if only they knew how. Great. I mean, that's awesome and inspiring to see what kind of nonsense you can build. But it's nice to see the other side of that story from time to time. Which I going back to the be, reInvent definitely. story, right? Like the reInvent story here it, that they're trying to tell is that something like 15%, Sheila, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 15% of enterprise workloads are migrated to the cloud, right? Like there's this huge end tap market of enterprise that needs to move to the cloud. Whereas every startup is starting on the cloud. There's no need to persuade us. We're already in, you know, in the choir. Uh, it's, right. it's a great, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great point, Liz. I mean, I think we often think about in, in my portfolio, in our ecosystem, we often think about, okay, let's get the cloud natives, let's get the kind of cloud awares, right? They're somewhere in their migration, and then let's get the cloud skeptics. And those are different categories of customers that we go after with different use cases and scenarios. Oh yeah, it's today. If you're if you're building a software startup and you build out a data center on day one, it's like at that point you're living out your career history and your previous job where you were the SVP of bad decisions at Yahoo or whatnot. It's it is not what most folks do. It's not the common path. The folks who are doing something very different and outside the norm, and that's okay. So let's let's take a look forward, I guess, in terms of what we think is going to be big next year, and and you know playing off the. Uh, the outage from yesterday, you know, I, I saw a joke um, this morning on Twitter that if, you know, if you weren't thinking about multi-cloud uh, before yesterday, then maybe maybe you're thinking about it today. And and I know that this has triggered Corey, so I, I, I really um, apologize for that. But I'd love to hear from, from everyone about what they really think about multi-cloud infrastructure strategies, like not just like running Salesforce and something else, but like actually running applications in different in different cloud providers and how realistic that is, how problematic that can be. There is there. I talk to so many people who accept this as the norm. Uh, and I don't think that's true in 2021. I think there's a chance that starts to become more mainstream in 22. Uh, but I would love to hear what you think. Okay, I, I, I guess I'll, oh, I'm no, by all means. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll dive in on that one. So I've generally been of the opinion that doing this is a bad idea. And it my my views on it are evolving, let's be clear. But I, even in an, an ideal world where everyone does things right, yeah, it's great. It's going to slow you down. It's going to cost a lot more, but it is going to shield you against single provider outages. In practice, when people attempt this, they first, they're trying to work in multiple providers causes more outages than they're trying than they actually manage to survive. Two, they wind up ex instead of having redundancy and resiliency, they're now exposed to outages from all of the providers that they're building on top of. I use Cloudflare in, in front of AWS for some of my stuff, and I'm aware of the fact that I am now instead of being resilient, I am in fact now doubling my risk exposure as a direct result. And for what I do, that trade off is fine. But people don't understand those trade offs as far as what it is they're giving up. It, we'd have to get a lot better as an industry about clearly delineating and disclosing what our exposure to these things is. Because even if you manage to do it perfectly correctly, great. Stripe is a big AWS customer as a reference customer, and they are they're handling payments across the board. If they go down, it doesn't matter how durable you and your application are. You're not taking anyone's credit card info until they come back. I, I think that's right, Corey. I think, though, it, in addition to that, we are seeing and, and you know, we, we often see the, the, the cutting edge of things in our business, but we are seeing enterprise build in a multi-cloud scenario. We have the cheat code of sort of getting to see that through the lens of Pulumi, where they are enabling customers to do that in an effective way. And of course, there's a lot more roadmap that needs to happen on that. But the reality is there is a natural occurring phenomena where people will pick different cloud platforms kind of from the bottom up technologist community. Technologists are going to make some of those decisions. Then you have kind of the tension of the top down coming from an enterprise computing perspective as well. And I think you will continue to also see multi-cloud from that perspective, one, to kind of not have one single relationship. And, you know, 
everybody does need Corey to help them negotiate their bills in this world. But what also helps negotiate your bill is if, if you're multi-cloud, so you don't have only one provider. And so both multiple providers actually have to treat you with um, both technical innovation, but then also with business side innovation and cost and affordability and things of this nature. And so I think that these, these different platforms coming together into an enterprise makes perfect sense and will absolutely be, be, the, be the trend. Yeah, M&A yeah. drives it too. The, the only challenge though is that we, then we're talking about different workloads in different environments and that's fine. I've never been opposed to that best workload for the job. It's the, we have this one application that needs to be able to run seamlessly across all the others. And that's where people get into trouble. They can't even but do that with one easier. provider across multiple regions. Yeah, but it will get easier. Yeah, it's a matter of right, like walking before you run. If you can't run in multiple regions, as Corey says, you don't have any business being multi multi cloud. And I also think it's a question of data locality, right? Like data, 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 right? Like there's a reason that these cloud providers are charging you nothing to ingress data, and they'll charge you an arm and a leg to egress the data, because if you need to run multi cloud, suddenly you're having to replicate your data in each environment, and that can get very expensive very fast. Is it actually worth it? Right? And this is why I'm a big fan of these service level objectives, right? of this idea that we need to make sure that we are keeping track of what is our actual reliability requirement, how much are we willing to spend to achieve that, and it's okay in some cases to say we are making the choice to be single cloud or even single region if that is what's appropriate to our business case. Just don't Liz, be I totally agree with you. in Virginia, right? <laughs> that's, that's Liz, I totally agree with you on the data gravity point because I do think that there's just, you know, data gravity is the, the heaviest force in, in tech, right? But concurrent with multi-cloud, we often talk about many cloud where you're actually able to pull information and data from different sources. And so we kind of use those two terms interchangeably for the architecture of the future. Again, it, you know, a lot of roadmap on that, but that that's where our hearts are. Yeah, and as to your point, Sheila, in terms of negotiating power, you lose negotiating power when you use a service that is only unique to one cloud provider, because that means that is that workload is bound to run there forever. Whereas as long turns as out there's less and less of those over time, right? <laughs> True. So, with the few minutes we have left, I'd like to um, invite you all to sort of give me a sense of the thing that's really top of mind for you heading into next year across anything in our industry, um, you know, things that um, you think are going to be actual opportunities for, for your businesses or for others that you talk to, um, technologies that you think are finally hitting their stride. Um, just love to hear a little bit more about, about what got you excited looking into the next year. I think the thing that has me the most excited is a resolution to the tension we've been seeing between management and workers, right? We're hearing this talk about the great resignation, right? About people working remotely, people having more flexibility in their careers, right? I think that in the next year, we're going to see some companies wildly succeeding at this and some companies getting it wrong and losing, and losing their workers. And I think that is a opportunity that, I, that I'm seeing in the next year is that people no longer have to put up with, for instance, really terrible work environments um, because they no longer are quite as tied to that employer. I, I totally agree with Liz from the point of view of the number one thing that we get asked about a portfolio company. I say, hey, you should look at a job at this company. They say, is it fully remote, hybrid or in the office? And so it, it's the number one question that people ask. Then it becomes the culture driver for the organization. Right. And so things that we've been investing in are how you build hybrid um, commercial real estate environments. But company like Verge Sense, company like Robin in our portfolio drive that. We've been invested in a virtual office platform with a company called Nooks. And we've also invested, though, in employee comms. Right. There's, we, we have a business called Simpler, which is really trying to bring you into a deeper communicative environment, even when you're all remote and kind of moving around. And so I think that there's just a ton of uh, focus on talent and how talent will will sort of uh, shift based on the philosophy of the organization on work. And then I think that that hits the more extreme point related to software developers, right? So the number one concern of all of our companies is hiring software developers. And so how do we think about the evolution of the life of the software developer in a world of crypto, in a world of DAOs, in a world of open source projects and kind of thinking about developer uh, monetization scenarios, what keeps developers happy at companies, what's the technology to serve that shift left movement that we talked about. 
that that's that's got me really excited for for 2022. I'm a grumpy old Unix sysadmin because it's not like there's another kind of Unix sysadmin once they've been doing it for more than 20 minutes. The for me, what makes me excited is the, some of the basic stuff. The the fact that intelligent tiering now embraces Glacier fat, uh, instant retrieval and has redu uh, eliminated the monitoring charge for small objects as well as the, uh, in the minimum of 30 day storage. At this point, it's the right answer and it saves a boatload of money. In standard tier S3, you're spending don't quote me on this, $23,000 a month per petabyte. If you can dramatically reduce that by just switching the storage class of what you're doing, that means that, you, there, that your limits as far as what, how much data you can afford to retain go way down, and you go way up. And you can, at that point, capture a lot more value from it in theory if our data science friends are right and not just basically tilting at windmills. But I'm excited to see less effort on the part of customers to do things more optimally. Yeah, I think Sheila and I are very much on the camp of like the people stuff is the most exciting stuff. The tech will sort itself out. Um, but I, I, but I, but I'm yeah. also a sucker for all the AI and ML innovation. We saw some great things from SageMaker at reInvent, but we're seeing you know the exact same things in the ecosystem in the industry that I think will take that to the next level. Right? We've built yeah. out a lot of this data infrastructure. Are we doing enough with it? Are we getting enough business outcomes? We, we couldn't be more thrilled for that next generation of data-driven computing. Yeah, I, I like it. I guess I am viewing it from a, uh, a, a more of a people perspective than I let on because whenever I talk to people about, so you, you haven't been doing this and you've been basically lighting tens of thousands of dollars a month on fire, they, they have this look of chagrin and they look crestfallen when, I, when they get this pointed out. Sure, they can fix it then, but they feel silly for not having done it before. This removes that, that psychological barrier, which cloud economics is always more about psychology than it is about math or computers, and, and gets them out of the right path sooner, faster. Making people happier is kind of what this whole thing's about. Well, and it's interesting to go back to one thing that Sheila said about the cloud oligarchs and, and you know, like our, this industry is run by three companies. And as the emphasis shifts towards people and towards developers and where they want to work and how they want to work, I mean, I think most of us have probably worked for big companies and big companies try to preserve what they have. They, they're slower to change with the way that they, with the times that change. And so I'm wondering if you all think this is maybe an existential problem for big cloud, you know, in terms of being able to preserve the developers they really need to drive the innovation they need to sell to their customers. I think the mega caps are hiring incredible technologists at the top. And so frankly, the, you know, we all, we were all sort of didn't know what would happen with the transition with Satya wow, that's gone incredibly, incredibly well. Uh, the Andy Jassy love for developers, but then bringing back Adam, who I, I love how Corey often talks about how the last mile of software is marketing and helping people understand what these products are. I think Adam will do a better job of that. And, you know, Google has more respect for tech leadership than anyone. So, so Sundar Pichai does a phenomenal job there. And I think that's when you get into the, hey, we can both innovate as well as have our existing businesses. And it doesn't help that it doesn't hurt that there's massive, massive uh, cash cows inside these companies that can fund an incredible amount of innovation that wins, innovation that doesn't win, and then also M and A based in innovation. I hear you say that, Sheila. But one of the things that I've heard is that since Thomas Corian took over Google Cloud, that that department has really suffered a brain drain. That there's a lot of demoralized Google employees that are leaving, especially given Google's lack of clarity around return to office. I think that's definitely going to be a challenge for Google going forward um, compared to the other companies that you mentioned. I, I, you're think, you're right. yeah. I, I think you're right on the um, kind of that will be the culture driver, right? So they and they will probably make a, a, a different decision that's very competitive on that, I would guess, soon. The one thing that I think TK does well is he buys great companies. And so he integrates them into GCP and GCP's culture. Yeah. Amazon's M&A strategy doesn't work super well. I mean, they buy companies, but not too many places want to sell for what amounts to three shiny buttons. So there's a bit of a challenge there. They're also seeing a bit of a brain drain themselves as technologists leave and go elsewhere. There's a belief that, oh, well, a lot of people boomerang and come back in later. Well, we're waiting to see. I, I think of it in terms of an Amazon rung springer, more or less, and a boomerang that doesn't come back is really just a stick. So stick or boomerang is always the open question when someone high profile leaves. 
and everyone's dealing with turnover issues. Don't get me wrong, but it it feels particularly more pronounced in the AWS side of the world right now. Well, I think it's pretty clear that the last couple of years have been a pretty prof a years of profound change for all of us, really. And 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 you know, it's really cloud has been sort of on this this meteoric rise for the last 10, 15 years. And and I think we're entering a period where of maturation where we're about to see some different uh, different patterns take hold. And and I really appreciate um, all of you today uh, sharing your thoughts on that. Please continue to follow that change on Protocol Enterprise. And uh, thank you all for being here today um, and hope you have a happy holiday season.